Hi everyone, it's Rebecca. I'm here at Elwyn teaching you how to make some butterflies out of $1 bills today. There's a lot of uh, celebrations coming up like graduations or birthdays or weddings and stuff like that. And not a lot of people have very much money. So um, this is an easy way that we can make a gift for as little as $2 today. So we're gonna take two $1 bills right here. And I'm gonna start by folding one in half like this. Okay. And then I'm gonna open it up and I am going to fold these corners in as if we were making paper airplanes. Um, just like this on both sides. So we have some corners, bear with me. And then I'm gonna flip it over and I'm gonna start folding it in a fan type motion like this, back and forth, back and forth. Now this is gonna take me a few minutes. So please, if you are making one with me, this is what we do, just slowly back and forth. Like this. Okay. And fold down the edges hard. And we're gonna take our finger and find the middle and fold it up in half like this. And we're gonna set it aside. Now we're gonna take our second dollar bill and we're gonna fold this one in half like this. And then we're going to take it and fan this one back and forth as well. Like this. It takes a little bit of practice, but with a little bit of patience, I'm sure everyone will have fun with this project. And they turn out absolutely gorgeous when you're finished. So we take that. Now I'm gonna fold this that way, down words in half, okay? Like this. Like a V shape. Like a V. So we're gonna have a V upward and a V downward, just like Vanessa. <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna set our pieces on top of a piece of ribbon. Now you can use dental floss or any other kind of um, string that you have, but you're gonna tie it really tight together and put it in a knot. Like that. And we're going to hold the ribbon like this and fan out our dollar bills. And we'll cut our little string because butterflies have little antennae. So we just Cut the string here. These scissors are acting up on me. And this is an easy way you can give a $2 present. A little butterfly right here, made out of two $1 bills. Right there. There you go. 
I hope everyone has fun making these. Um, I put them on birthday presents or money trees for weddings or graduation lays. Um, they're fun to make necklaces with or any, any gift. Um, enjoy. Have a good day, everyone. Yay. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Those are super cool. Did you get it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love it. I got it. Awesome. I love it. <laughs> My first butterfly. Oh. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you can join us again for some fun. I'm <laughs> trying, you guys. You guys, are, awesome. you guys are, you're doing a great job. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I miss you all. I'll see you soon. Where's your scissors at? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Really cool project there. So I'm just checking to see if most of you, well, all of you should have received your packet this week. And we're super excited to show that Grace was um, in the military, although she's not currently serving. We are super, super proud of Grace that she did um you know, honor our country and have the service to the military. She was in the army and she is now a part of our Fountain Valley team. So we just wanted to point that out and let you guys know that, um, wow. And um, she was 18 years old when she joined the military. She was a truck driver in the military. And what made her become very interested in becoming a um, Joining the Army was her dad was an Army reservist. So it really sparked Grace's interest. And as soon as she turned 18, she was like, hey, I'm hitting the road. I'm heading to the military. And she set goals for herself. She did an amazing job. She um, actually went to the military wanting to possibly be trained in the office and work in Monterey, California, kind of close to her home. But to the, her surprise, once she got there, that's not what they had for her. So Grace ended up still joining the military. And can you believe Miss Grace Dawson? She was a truck driver in the military. My goodness, ah. what, a, what a big thing to handle. Um, she was considered a motor transport operator. And um, she entered the military on October, November 28th, which she said right after Thanksgiving. They had her come right in right away. She went to Fort Jackson, long way from California, um, in South Carolina. And so she did her basic training in boot camp, which she was really, really homesick for the first couple of weeks. Um, she then, after she finished that, 
she took the oath and enlist, enlisted in the army. And um, from there, we have so much more to tell you soon about Mrs. Grace's experiences in the military. We thank her again. We thank all of you veterans and all of you um, that were, you know, we thank your families for um, sacrificing and family members that have um, served in the military. Um, you know, where would we be in this world without you guys? But we truly, truly appreciate you. We appreciate being just a team with Grace and we're happy to have her here with us. So with that being said, we're going to bring our truck driver over here to read you a story. Amen, Miss Grace. Yes, thank you Grace. so much. And thank you to Miss Lee. You. Thank you to Miss Lee that you're always watching. Thank you for tuning in. Have fun awesome. where you're at. Awesome. Where you're at. I mean, um, she says, I'm at Dallas, Texas right now while watching this video. Thank you thank so much, Miss Lee. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So here is our Miss Grace, and we thank you so much, Grace. We truly do appreciate wow, you. So and for great. those who are serving, serving right now, yes. yes. All righty. I know. I always feel like a, I feel like a little cheap uh, to claim that I'm a veteran because I did not have to go off to any conflicts anywhere. But for that, I am of course very grateful. But I do deserve the, the title veteran because, hey, if something had come up, that's where I'd be. And that's what we train for, and that's what we're ready for. And then we pray it never happens, right? Right. <laughs> so, well, thank you all for uh, that. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. We appreciate you. So, I started reading the book Stuart Little to you guys the other day. I feel very weird in this little circular table here. But I'm like, I'm, I feel like you, I don't have a bottom half. I'm just a little automated grace here. <laughs> so uh, I thought I would read some more of this because uh, there's little adventures. And we finished the one where he was rolled up in the, um, uh, the blinds. And then he, thankfully, somebody pulled the blinds down and freed him. But else we don't know what would have happened, but I don't think it would have been good. So let's pick up where we left off. And now we're going to be on chapter six, a fair breeze. So one morning when the wind was from the west, Stuart put on his sailor suit and his sailor hat, took his spyglass down from the shelf and set out for a walk full of the joy of life and the fear of dogs. And with a rolling gait, he sauntered along toward Fifth Avenue, keeping a sharp lookout. So here he is. It's kind of hard to see here. He's very small because he's a mouse and he's got on a little sailor suit there and he's looking out as he's climbed up on top of a uh, fire hydrant, which is probably not the best place to avoid a dog, but let's see where we go with this. Oh, because let me show you over here. There's a little dog. Well, that's what he's looking out for. Whenever he spied a dog through his glass, Stuart would hurry to the nearest doorman climb up his trouser leg and hide in the tails of his uniform. And once, when no doorman was handy, he had to crawl into yesterday's paper and rolled himself up in the second section till danger was past. At the corner of Fifth Avenue, there were several people waiting for the uptown bus and Stuart joined them. Nobody noticed him because he wasn't tall enough to be noticed. I'm not tall enough to be noticed, thought Stuart yet I'm tall enough to want to go to 72nd Street. So when the bus came into view, all the men waved their canes to get the bus driver's attention and their briefcases at the driver and Stuart waved his spyglass. I'm not sure if anybody could see him. Then knowing that the step of the bus would be too high for him, Stuart seized the hold of the cuff of a gentleman's pants and was swung aboard without any trouble or inconvenience whatsoever. So here's a picture and little Stuart's down here on the pants leg, just getting a free ride onto the bus there. We can't do that, can we? Well, Stuart never paid any fare on the bus because it wasn't big enough to carry an ordinary dime. <laughs> a dime. How old is this book? The only time he ever had attempted to carry a dime, 
He had rolled the coin along like a hoop while he raced along beside it, but it had gotten away from him on a hill and had been snatched up by an old woman with, uh, who, with no teeth. <laughs> well, she probably needed it more than he did. They were handsome little things. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I skipped a sentence. After that experience, Stuart contented himself with the tiny coins, which his mother, father made for him out of tinfoil. They were handsome little things, although rather hard to see without putting on your spectacles. When the conductor came around to collect the fares, Stuart fished into his purse and pulled out a coin no bigger than the eye of a grasshopper. What's that you're offering me? asked the conductor. It's one of my dimes, said Stuart. Well, is it now, said the conductor. Well, I'd have a fine time explaining that to the bus company. Why, you're no bigger than a dime yourself. Yes, I am, replied Stuart angrily. I'm more than twice as big as a dime. A dime only comes up to here on me. And Stuart pointed to his hip. Furthermore, he added, I didn't come on this bus to be insulted. I beg pardon, said the conductor. You'll have to forgive me for I had no idea in all the world there was such a small sailor. So live and learn, muttered Stuart, tartly putting his change purse back in his pants. When the bus stopped at 72nd Street, Stuart jumped out and hurried across the sailboat pond. Oh, sorry, jumped down and hurried across to the sailboat. Sail, say this three times real fast. Sailboat, sailboat, sailboat to the sailboat pond in Central Park. Over the pond, the west wind blew, and into the teeth of the west wind sailed the sloops and schooners, their rails well down, their wet decks gleaming. The owners, boys and grown men, raced around the cement shores, hoping to arrive at the other side in, in, the other side in time to keep the boats from bumping. So there's little boats on the lake here, and uh, that's what a lot of people do. They have hobbies of uh, little boats that maybe like yay big is all, which would be the perfect size for Stuart, of course. Uh, but the people just would sail them and watch them, and that was just a hobby up there. So that's kind of fun. It says some of the toy boats were not as small as you might think. But when you got close to them, you found out that their main mast was taller than a man's head. And they were beautifully made, with everything ship shape and ready for sea. To Stuart, they seemed enormous, and he hoped he'd be able to get aboard one of them and sail away to the far corners of the pond. He was an adventurous little fellow and loved the feel of the breeze in his face and the cry of the gulls overhead and the heat of the great, the heave of the great swell under him. He's interested in sailing. As he sat cross-legged on the wall that surrounds the pond, gazing out at the ships through his spyglass, Stuart noticed that one boat that seemed to him finer and prouder than the others. Now, so here's Stuart on the edge of the pond. There's a little pond edge and he's got his spyglass and he's checking out the boats. And this one seems to him finer and prouder than any other. Her name was Wasp. She was a big black schooner flying the American flag. She had a clipper bow and on her foredeck was mounted a three inch cannon. She's the ship for me, thought Stuart. And the next time she sailed in, he ran over to where she was being turned around. Excuse me, sir said Stuart to the man who was turning her. But are you the owner of the schooner Wasp? And here's Stuart talking to the schooner owner. I am, replied the man, surprised to be addressed by a mouse in a sailor suit. I am looking for a berth in a good ship, continued Stuart. And I thought perhaps you might sign me on. I'm strong and I'm quick. Are you sober, asked the owner of the wasp. I do my work, said Stuart crisply. The man looked sharply at him. He couldn't help admiring the trim appearance and bold manner of this diminutive seafaring character. Well, he said at length, pointing to the prow of the wasp on, out towards the center of the pond, I'll tell you what I'll do with you. You see that big racing sloop out there? 
I do, said Stuart. That's the Lillian B. Walmrath, said the man, and I hate her with all my heart. Then so do I, said Stuart loyally. I hate her because she was always bumping into my boat, continued the man, and because her owner is a lazy boy who doesn't understand sailing and who hardly knows a squall from a squid. Or a jib from a jibe, cried Stuart, or a fluff from a leech, bellowed the man, or a deck from a dock, screamed Stuart, or a mast from a mist, yelled the man. But hold on now, no more of this, I'll tell you what we'll do. The Lillian B. Wolmrath has been has always been able to beat the wasp sailing. But I believe that if my schooner were properly handled, it would be a different story. Nobody knows how I suffer standing here on shore, helpless, watching the wasp blunder along when all she needs is a steady hand on her helm. So, my young friend, I'll let you sail the wasp across the pond and back. If you can beat that detestable sloop, I'll give you a regular job. Aye, aye, sir, said Stuart, swinging himself aboard the schooner and taking, uh, she's taking his place at the wheel. Ready about. So here they are over here. It's a very, very little picture of them at the side watching Stuart get onto the ship. One moment, said the man. Do you mind telling me how you propose to beat the other boat? I intend to crack on more sail, said Stuart. Not in my boat, thank you, replied the man. I don't want you capsizing in a squall. Well then, said Stuart, I'll catch the sloop broad on and rake her with my fire from my fire from my forward gun. Foul means, said the man. I want this to be a boat race, not a naval engagement. Well then, said Stu Stuart cheerfully, I'll sail the wasp straight and true and let the Lillian B. Walmarath go yawning all over the pond. Bravo, cried the man, and good luck go with you. And so saying, he let go of the wasp's prow. A puff of air bellied out of the schooner's headsail, bellied out the schooner's headsails, and she paid off and filled, aw filled away on the port track heeling gracefully over to the breeze while Stuart twirled her wheel and braced himself against a deck cleat. So in other words, the wind was coming up and the sails got full and they were heading out. By the by, yelled the man, you haven't told me your name yet. Name is Stuart Little, called Stuart at the top of his lungs. I'm the second son of Frederick C. Little of this city. Bon voyage, Stuart, hollered his friend. Take care of yourself and bring the wasp home safe. That I will, shouted Stuart. And he was so proud and happy, he let go of the wheel for a second and did a little dance on the sloping deck. And never noticing how narrowly he escaped hitting a tramp steamer that was drifting his path with all her engines disabled and her decks awashed. So here's a little tramp steamer behind him here that they're talking about. And he's just kind of barely gliding by because... Probably should have been paying a little bit more attention, but he was, as you can possibly see here, he is on the deck dancing a little jig in, of happiness. So fortunately, they did not run into each other, and on he went. Chapter 7, The Sailboat Race. When the people in Central Park learned that one of the toy sailboats was being steered by a mouse in a sailor suit, they all came running. Soon the shores of the pond were so crowded that a policeman was sent from headquarters to announce that everybody would have to stop pushing. But nobody did. People in New York like to push each other. The most excited person of all was the boy who owned the Lillian B. Walmrath. He was a fat, sulky boy of 12 named Leroy. He wore a blue serge suit and a white necktie stained with orange juice. Come back here, he called to Stuart. Come back here and get on my boat. I want you to steer my boat. I will pay you $5 a week, and you can have every Thursday afternoon off and a radio in your room, too. I thank you for your kind offer, replied Stuart. But I am happily aboard the Wasp, happier than I have ever been before in all my life. And with that, he spun the wheel over smartly and headed his schooner down toward the starting line, 
where Leroy was turning his boat around by poking it with a long stick, ready for the start of the race. You see people are coming over the hills and they're running down there to the pond to see what's going on. A mouse is on a boat. I'll be the referee, said a man in a bright green suit. Is the wasp ready? Ready, sir, shouted Stuart, touching his hat. Is the Lillian B. Womrath ready, asked the referee. Sure, I'm ready, said Leroy. To the north end of the pond and back again, shouted the referee. On your mark, get set, go. Go, cried the people along the shore. Go, cried the owner of the wasp. Go, yelled the policeman, too. And away went the two boats toward the north end of the pond, while seagulls wheeled and cried <laughs> overhead, and the taxi cabs tooted and honked from 72nd Street, and the west wind, which had come halfway across America to get to Central Park, sang and whistled in the rigging and blew spray across the decks, stinging Stuart's cheeks with little tiny fragments of flying peanut shell tossed from the foamy deep. This is the life for me, Stuart murmured to himself. What a ship, what a day, what a race. Before the two boats had gone many feet, however, an accident happened on shore. Oh dear, the people were pushing each other harder and harder in their eagerness to see the sport. And although they really didn't mean to, they pushed the policeman so hard, they pushed him right off the concrete wall and into the pond. He hit the water in a sitting position and got wet clear up to the third button of his jacket. Uh-oh, there he goes. Dink. That's not good. This particular policeman was not only a big, heavy man, but he had just eaten a big, heavy meal. And the wave he made curling outward, cresting and billowing, upsetting all small craft and causing every owner of a boat in the pond to scream with delight and consternation. <laughs> when Stuart saw the great wave approaching, he jumped for the rigging, but he was too late. Towering above the wasp like a mountain, the wave came crashing and piling along the deck. The wave came crashing and carried Stuart up and swept him over the side and into the water. So well, here is this water coming up and knocking the boat, and it just swept Stuart off. And uh, everybody thought that Stuart was probably going to drown. And Stuart had no intention of drowning. He kicked hard with his feet and thrashed hard with his tail. In a minute or two, he climbed back aboard the schooner, cold and wet, but quite unharmed. As he took his place on the helm, he could hear people cheering for him and calling, at a mouse, Stuart, at a mouse. Well, here he is crawling back up on the edge at the bottom of the page there. He's climbing back on the deck of the ship. He looked over and saw that the wave had capsized the Lillian B. Womrath, but she had righted herself and was sailing on her close course close by. And she stayed close alongside till both boats reached the north end of the pond. Here, Stuart put the wasp around, and Leroy turned the Lillian around with his stick, and away the two boats went for the finish line. This race isn't over yet, thought Stuart. The first warning he had that there was trouble ahead came when he glanced into the wasp's cabin and observed that the barometer had fallen sharply. That can mean only one thing at sea, dirty weather. Suddenly a dark cloud swept across the sun, blotting it out and leaving the earth in a shadow. Stuart shivered in his wet clothes. He turned up his sailor's blouse closer around his neck, and when he spied the wasp's owner among the crowd on shore, he waved his hat and called out, Dirty weather ahead, sir. Wind backing to the southwest sees confused glass failing. Never mind the weather, cried the owner. Watch out for flotsam dead ahead. Flotsam is just stuff that's in the water. For Stuart peered ahead at the gathering storm, but saw nothing except gray waves with white crests. The world seemed cold and ominous. 
Stuart glanced behind him. There came the sloop, boiling along fast, rolling up a bow wave and gaining steadily. Look out, Stuart! Look out where you're going! Stuart strained his eyes, and suddenly, dead ahead, right in the path of the wasp, he saw an enormous paper bag looming up on the surface of the pond. So here's his boat, and this is the paper bag. Uh-oh, the paper bag is really big compared to his boat, isn't it? So, uh, now it's not... Uh, the, the bag was empty and riding high, its open end gaping wide like the mouth of a cave. Stuart spun the wheel over, but it was too late. The wasp drove her bow spirit straight into the bag, and with a fearful whoosh, the schooner slowed down and came into the wind with all sails flapping. Just at this moment, Stuart heard a splintering crash and saw the boat of the Lillian plow through his rigging and felt the whole ship tremble from step to stern with the force of the collision. So the Wamrath has now crashed into his boat, the Wasp. A collision, shouted the crowd on shore. In a jiffy, the two boats were in a terrible tangle. Little boys on shore screamed and danced up and down. Meanwhile, the paper brag sprang a leak and began to fill. The wasp couldn't move because of the bag. The Lillian B. Walmrath couldn't move because her nose was stuck in the wasp's rigging. Waving his arms, Stuart ran forward and fired off his gun. Really soon, then he heard above the other voices on the shore, shore the voice of the owner of the wasp yelling directions and telling him what to do. Stuart, Stuart, down jib. Down stay sail. Stuart jumped for the halyards and the jib and the forestail came rippling down. Cut away all paper bags, roared the owner. Stuart whipped out his pocket knife and slashed away bravely at the soggy back until he had the deck to clear. So he's cutting the wet paper bag off of the ship. Now back your foresail and give her a fool, screamed the owner of the wasp. Stuart grabbed the foresail boom and plunged with all his might. Slowly, the schooner paid off and began to gather headway. And as she heeled over to the breeze, she rolled her rail out from under Lillian's nose. She shook herself free and stood away to the southard. A loud cheer went up from the bank. Stuart sprang to the wheel and answered it. Then he looked back, and to his great joy, he perceived that the Lillian had gone off in a wild direction and was yawing all over the pond. Now, this is a lot of sailing talk that I don't even understand myself, but I think we can figure out Stuart's doing pretty good here. Straight and true, sailed the wasp with Stuart at the helm, and after she had crossed the finish line, Stuart brought her alongside the wall and was taken ashore and highly praised for his fine sheer seamanship and dairy. So here's all the people that are there and they're like around Stuart there. They're like, yeah, good job, all right. And plus you had to be brave to do all that stuff too. The owner was delighted and said it was the happiest day of his life. He introduced himself to Stuart, said that in his private life, he was Dr. Paul Carey, a surgeon dentist. He said that model boats were his hobby and that he would be delighted to have Stuart take command of his tiny vessel at any time. Everybody sh oh, shook hands with Stuart. Everybody that is, except the policeman who was too wet and too mad to shake hands with a mouse. So it's very wet. Things are dripping off of him. I'm guessing he's in a bad mood. When Stuart got home that night, his brother George asked him where he'd been all day. Oh, Knocking around town, replied Stuart. Now, that is the end of chapter seven. And I think that uh, it seems like it's the end of the little story here of his adventure in town on the sailboat. Pretty exciting. A nice sailboat, just size for a mouse. Uh, my actually neighbor 
builds those kind of sailboats in his garage and takes them out to the pond over at Huntington Beach. So I've seen some of those boats and they're very nice and people put a lot of time into them. So I can understand why Dr. Carey would be wanting his boat to come out better than the other ones, especially when the other boat was taken care of by a kid that just didn't really know what he was doing. So good job, Stuart Little. You brought hit pride to the boat's owner. The owner of the Wasp is happy now. So next time there is a chapter eight titled Margolo. Margolo, I don't know what a Margolo is. It sounds like a name, but we will find out next time we read some more of Stuart Little. Thank you for joining me today. And I hope that you all have a great day and a happy time. And if you get on a sailboat, be careful. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Grace, so much. You did an amazing job. So before we log off, before we log off. Look what Vanessa and myself made. We've already made us some butterflies. It's really easy to make. Thank Have you, Rebecca. Fun. Thank you, Rebecca. Well, I'm Hi, you guys. All right. Yeah, it was fun, Grace. Really fun. Only with $2, though. Okay, thank you. Have a good day today. Bye-bye. It was really fun.